Section 4 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. By John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 4. New Salem. During the latter part of the winter of the deep snow, Lincoln became acquainted with one Denton Offutt, an adventurous and discursive sort of merchant, with more irons in the fire than he could well manage. He wanted to take a flat boat and cargo to New Orleans, and having heard that Hanks and Lincoln had some experience of the river, he insisted on their joining him. John Johnston was afterwards added to the party probably at the request of his foster brother, to share in the golden profits of the enterprise. For fifty cents a day and a contingent dividend of twenty dollars apiece seemed like a promise of immediate opulence to the boys. In the spring, when the rivers broke up and the melting snow began to pour in torrents down every ravine and gully, the three young men paddled down the Sangamon in a canoe to the point where Jamestown now stands whence they walked five miles to springfield where offutt had given them rendezvous they met him at elliot's tavern and far from happy amid the multiplicity of his engagements he had failed to procure a flatboat and the first work his new hands must do was to build one they cut the timber with frontier innocence from congress land and soon had a serviceable craft afloat with which they descended the current of the Sangamon to New Salem, a little village which seems to have been born for the occasion, as it came into existence just before the arrival of Lincoln, nourished for seven years while he remained one of its citizens, and died soon after he went away. His introduction to his fellow citizens was effected in a peculiar and somewhat striking manner. Offutt's boat had come to serious embarrassment on Rutledge's mill dam, and the unwanted incident brought the entire population to the water's edge. They spent a good part of the day watching the hapless flat boat resting midships on the dam, the forward end in the air and the stern taking in the turbid Sangamon water. Nobody knew what to do with the disaster except the bow oar, who was described as a gigantic youth with his trousers rolled up some five feet, who was wading about the boat and rigging up some undescribed contrivance by which the cargo was unloaded, the boat tilted and the water let out by boring a hole through the bottom, and everything brought safely to moorings below the dam. This exploit gained for young Lincoln the enthusiastic admiration of his employer, and turned his own mind in the direction of an invention which he afterwards patented for lifting vessels over shoals. The model on which he obtained this patent, a little boat whittled by his own hand in 1849, after he had become prominent as a lawyer and politician, is still shown to visitors at the Department of the Interior. We have never learned that it has served any other purpose. They made a quick trip down the Sangamon, the Illinois, and the Mississippi Rivers, Although it was but a repetition, in great part, of the trip young Lincoln had made with Gentry, it evidently created a far deeper impression on his mind than the former one. The simple and honest words of John Hanks leave no doubt of this. At New Orleans, he said, they saw for the first time Negroes chained, maltreated, whipped, and scourged. Lincoln saw it, his heart bled said nothing much, was silent, looked bad. I can say, knowing it, that it was on this trip that he formed his opinion of slavery. It run its iron in him then and there, May 1831. I have heard him say so often. The sight of men in chains was intolerable to him. Ten years after this he made another journey by water with his friend Joshua Speed of Kentucky. Writing to Speed about it after the lapse of fourteen years, he says, In 1841 you and I had together a tedious low-water trip on a steamboat from Louisville to St. Louis. 
You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio there were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me, and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio or any other slave border. It is not fair for you to assume that I have no interest in a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable. There have been several ingenious attempts to show the origin and occasion of Mr. Lincoln's anti-slavery convictions. They seem to us an idle waste of labor. These sentiments came with the first awakening of his mind and conscience, and were roused into active life and energy by the sight of fellow creatures in chains, on an Ohio River steamboat, and on the wharf at New Orleans. The party went up the river in the early summer and separated in St. Louis. Abraham walked in company with John Johnston from St. Louis to Coles County, and spent a few weeks there with his father, who had made another migration the year before. His final move was to Goose Nest Prairie, where he died in 1851. Footnote his grave, a mile and a half west of the town of Farmington, Illinois, is surmounted by an appropriate monument erected by his grandson, the Honorable Robert T. Lincoln. End footnote. At the age of seventy-three years, after a life which, though not successful in any material or worldly point of view, was probably far happier than that of his illustrious son, being unvexed by enterprise or ambition, Abraham never lost sight of his parents. He continued to aid and befriend them in every way, even when he could ill afford it, and when his benefactions were imprudently used. He not only comforted their declining years with every aid his affection could suggest, but he did everything in his power to assist his stepbrother, Johnston, a hopeless task enough. The following rigidly truthful and yet kindly letters will show how mentor-like and masterful, as well as generous, were the relations that Mr. Lincoln held to these friends and companions of his childhood. Dear Johnston, your request for eighty dollars I do not think it best to comply with now. At the various times when I have helped you a little, you have said to me, We can get along very well now but in a very short time I find you in the same difficulty again. Now this can only happen by some defect in your conduct. What that defect is, I think I know. You are not lazy, and still you are an idler. I doubt whether, since I saw you, you have done a good whole day's work in any one day. You do not very much dislike to work, and still you do not work much, merely because it does not seem to you that you could get much for it. This habit of uselessly wasting time is the whole difficulty, and it is vastly important to you, and still more so to your children, that you should break the habit. It is more important to them because they have longer to live, and can keep out of an idle habit before they are in it easier than they can get out after they are in. You are now in need of some money, and what I propose is that you shall go to work tooth and nail for somebody who will give you money for it. Let father and your boys take charge of things at home, prepare for a crop and make the crop, and you go to work for the best money wages, or in discharge of any debt you owe that you can get. And to secure you a fair reward for your labor, I now promise you that for every dollar you will, between this and the first of next May, get for your own labor either in money or as discharging your own indebtedness, I will then give you one other dollar. By this, if you hire yourself at ten dollars a month, from me you will get ten more, making twenty dollars a month for your work. In this I do not mean you should go off to St. Louis, or the lead mines, or the gold mines in California, but I mean for you to go at it for the best wages you can get close to home, in Coles County. Now, if you will do this, you will soon be out of debt, and what is better, you will have a habit that will keep you from getting in debt again. But if I should now clear you out of debt, next year you would be just as deep in as ever. You say you would almost give your place in heaven for seventy or eighty dollars. 
then you value your place in heaven very cheap for i am sure you can with the offer i make get the seventy or eighty dollars for four or five months work you say if I will furnish you the money, you will deed me the land, and if you don't pay the money back, you will deliver possession. Nonsense! If you can't now live with the land, how will you then live without it? You have always been kind to me, and I do not mean to be unkind to you. On the contrary, if you will but follow my advice, you will find it worth more than eighty times eighty dollars to you. Here is a later epistle, still more graphic and terse in statement, which has the unusual merit of painting both confessor and penitent to the life. Shelbyville, November 4, 1851 Dear Brother, When I came into Charleston, day before yesterday, I learned that you were anxious to sell the land where you live and move to Missouri. I have been thinking of this ever since, and cannot but think such a notion is utterly foolish. What can you do in Missouri better than here? Is the land any richer? Can you there, any more than here, raise corn and wheat and oats without work? Will anybody there, any more than here, do your work for you? If you intend to go to work, there is no better place than right where you are. If you do not intend to go to work, you cannot get along anywhere. Squirming and crawling about from place to place can do no good. You have raised no crop this year, and what you really want is to sell the land, get the money, and spend it. Part with the land you have, and my life upon it you will never after own a spot big enough to bury you in. Half you will get for the land you will spend in moving to Missouri, and the other half you will eat and drink and wear out, and no foot of land will be bought. Now I feel it is my duty to have no hand in such a piece of foolery. I feel that it is so even on your own account, and particularly on mother's account. The eastern forty acres I intend to keep for mother while she lives. If you will not cultivate it, it will rent for enough to support her. At least it will rent for something. Her dower in the other two forties she can let you have, and no thanks to me. Now do not misunderstand this letter. I do not write it in any unkindness. I write it in order, if possible, to get you to face the truth, which truth is, you are destitute because you have idled away all your time. Your thousand pretenses deceive nobody but yourself. Go to work is the only cure for your case. A volume of disquisition could not put more clearly before the reader the difference between Abraham Lincoln and the common run of southern and western rural laborers. He had the same disadvantages that they had. He grew up in the midst of poverty and ignorance. He was poisoned with the enervating malaria of the western woods, as all his fellows were, and the consequences of it were seen in his character and conduct to the close of his life. But he had, what very few of them possessed any glimmering notion of, a fixed and inflexible will to succeed. He did not love work, probably any better than John Johnston, but he had an innate self-respect and a consciousness that his self was worthy of respect that kept him from idleness as it kept him from all other vices, and made him a better man every year that he lived. We have anticipated a score of years in speaking of Mr. Lincoln's relations to his family, it was in August of the year 1831 that he finally left his father's roof, and swung out for himself into the current of the world to make his fortune in his own way. He went down to New Salem again to assist Offutt, in the business that lively speculator thought of establishing there. He was more punctual than either his employer or the merchandise, and met with the usual reward of punctuality in being forced to waste his time in waiting for the tardy ones. He seemed to the New Salem people to be loafing. Several of them have given that description of him. He did one day's work acting as clerk of a local election, a lettered loafer being pretty sure of employment on such an occasion. Footnote. Mrs. Lizzie H. Bell writes of this incident. My father, Menton Graham, was on that day as usual appointed to be a clerk, and Mr. McNamee, who was to be the other, was sick and failed to come. They were looking around for a man to fill his place when my father noticed Mr. Lincoln, and asked if he could write. 
he answered that he could make a few rabbit tracks. End footnote. He also piloted a boat down the Sangamon for one Dr. Nelson, who had had enough of New Salem and wanted to go to Texas. This was probably a task not requiring much pilot craft, as the river was much swollen, and navigators had in most places two or three miles of channel to count upon. But Offutt and his goods arrived at last, and Lincoln and he got them immediately into position, and opened their doors to what commerce could be found in New Salem. There was clearly not enough to satisfy the volatile mind of Mr. Offutt, for he soon bought Cameron's mill at the historic dam, and made Abraham superintendent also of that branch of the business. It is to be surmised that Offutt never inspired his neighbors and customers with any deep regard for his solidity of character. One of them says of him, with injurious pleonism, that he talked too much with his mouth. A natural consequence of his excessive fluency was soon to be made disagreeably evident to his clerk. He admired Abraham beyond measure, and praised him beyond prudence. He said that Abe knew more than any man in the United States, and he was certainly not warranted in making such an assertion, as his own knowledge of the actual state of science in America could not have been exhaustive. He also said that Abe could beat any man in the county running, jumping, or wrestling. This proposition, being less abstract in its nature, was more readily grasped by the local mind, and was not likely to pass unchallenged. Public opinion at New Salem was formed by a crowd of ruffianly young fellows who were called the Clary's Grove Boys. Once or twice a week they descended upon the village and passed the day in drinking, fighting, and brutal horseplay. If a stranger appeared in the place, he was likely to suffer a rude initiation into the social life of New Salem at the hands of these jovial savages. Sometimes he was nailed up in a hogshead and rolled downhill. Sometimes he was insulted into a fight and then mauled, black and blue. For despite their pretensions to chivalry, they had no scruples about fair play or any such superstitions of civilization. At first they did not seem inclined to molest young Lincoln. His appearance did not invite insolence. His reputation for strength and activity was a greater protection to him than his inoffensive good nature. But the loud admiration of Offutt gave them umbrage. It led to dispute, contradictions, and finally to a formal banter to a wrestling match. Lincoln was greatly averse to all this wooling and pulling, as he called it, but Offutt's indiscretion had made it necessary for him to show his mettle. Jack Armstrong, the leading bully of the gang, was selected to throw him, and expected an easy victory. But he soon found himself in different hands from any he had heretofore engaged with. Seeing he could not manage the tall stranger, his friends swarmed in, and by kicking and tripping nearly succeeded in getting Lincoln down. At this, as has been said of another hero, the spirit of Odin entered into him, and putting forth his whole strength, he held the pride of Clary's Grove in his arms like a child, and almost choked the exuberant life out of him. For a moment a general fight seemed inevitable, but Lincoln, standing undismayed with his back to the wall, looked so formidable in his defiance that an honest admiration took the place of momentary fury and his initiation was over. As to Armstrong, he was Lincoln's friend and sworn brother as soon as he recovered the use of his larynx, and the bond thus strangely created lasted through life. Lincoln had no further occasion to fight his own battles, while Armstrong was there to act as his champion. The two friends, although so widely different, were helpful to each other afterwards in many ways and Lincoln made ample amends for the liberty his hands had taken with Jack's throat, by saving, in a memorable trial, his son's neck from the halter. This incident, trivial and vulgar as it may seem, was of great importance in Lincoln's life. His behavior in this ignoble scuffle did the work of years for him, in giving him the position he required in the community where his lot was cast. He became, from that moment, in a certain sense, a personage, with a name and standing of his own. 
The verdict of Clary's Grove was unanimous that he was the cleverest fellow that had ever broke into the settlement. He did not have to be constantly scuffling to guard his self-respect, and at the same time he gained the goodwill of the better sort by his evident peaceableness and integrity. He made, on the whole, a satisfactory clerk for Mr. Offutt, though his downright honesty must have seemed occasionally as eccentric in that position as afterwards it did to his associates at the bar. Dr. Holland has preserved one or two incidents of this kind, which have their value. Once, after he had sold a woman a little bill of goods and received the money, he found on looking over the account again that she had given him six and a quarter cents too much. The money burned in his hands until he locked the shop and started on a walk of several miles in the night to make restitution before he slept. On another occasion, after weighing and delivering a pound of tea, he found a small weight on the scales. He immediately weighed out the quantity of tea of which he had innocently defrauded his customer and went in search of her, his sensitive conscience not permitting any delay. To show that the young merchant was not too good for this world, the same writer gives an incident of his shopkeeping experience of a different character. A rural bully having made himself especially offensive one day, when women were present, by loud profanity, Lincoln requested him to be silent. This was of course a cause of war, and the young clerk was forced to follow the incensed ruffian into the street, where the combat was of short duration. Lincoln threw him at once to the ground, and gathering a handful of the dog fennel, with which the roadside was plentifully bordered, he rubbed the ruffian's face and eyes with it until he howled for mercy. He did not howl in vain, for the placable giant, when his discipline was finished, brought water to bathe the culprit's smarting face, and doubtless improved the occasion with quaint admonition. A few passages at arms of this sort gave Abraham a redoubtable reputation in the neighborhood. But the principal use he made of his strength and his prestige was in the capacity of peacemaker, an office which soon devolved upon him by general consent. Whenever old feuds blossomed into fights by Offutt's door, or the chivalry of Clary's Grove attempted in its energetic way to take the conceit out of some stranger, or a canine duel spread contagion of battle among the masters of the beasts, Lincoln usually appeared upon the scene, and with a judicious mixture of force and reason, and invincible good nature, restored peace. While working with Offutt, his mind was turned in the direction of English grammar. From what he had heard of it, he thought it a matter within his grasp, if he could once fall in with the requisite machinery. Consulting with Minton, Footnote. This name has always been written in Illinois Minter, but a letter from Mr. Graham's daughter, Mrs. Bell, says that her father's name is as given in the text. End footnote. Graham, the schoolmaster, in regard to it, in learning the whereabouts of a vagrant, Kirkham's grammar, he set off at once and soon returned from a walk of a dozen miles with the coveted prize. He devoted himself to the new study with that peculiar intensity of application which always remained his most valuable faculty, and soon knew all that can be known about it from rules. He seemed surprised, as others have been, at the meagre dimensions of the science he had acquired, and the ease with which it yielded all there was of it to the student. But it seemed no slight achievement to the new Salemites, and contributed not a little to the prevalent impression of his learning. His name is prominently connected with an event which just at this time caused an excitement and interest in Salem, and the neighboring towns entirely out of proportion to its importance. It was one of the articles of faith of most of the settlers on the banks of the Sangamon River that it was a navigable stream, and the local politicians found that they could in no way more easily hit the fancy of their hearers than by discussing this assumed fact, and the logical corollary derived from it, that it was the duty of the state or the nation to clear out the snags and give free course to the commerce which was waiting for an opportunity to pour along this natural highway. At last one Captain Vincent Bogue of Springfield determined to show that the thing could be done by doing it. The first promise of the great enterprise appears in the Sangsmo Journal 
of January 26, 1832, in a letter from the captain, at Cincinnati, saying he would ascend the Sangamon by steam on the breaking up of the ice. He asked that he might be met at the mouth of the river by ten or twelve men, having axes with long handles to cut away the overhanging branches of the trees on the banks. From this moment there was great excitement, public meetings, appointment of committees, appeals for subscriptions, and a scattering fire of advertisements of goods and freight to be bargained for, which sustained the prevailing interest. It was a day of hope and promise when the advertisement reached Springfield from Cincinnati that the splendid upper cabin steamer Talisman would positively start for the Sangamon on a given day. As the paper containing this joyous intelligence also complained that no mail had reached Springfield from the east for three weeks, it is easy to understand the desire for more rapid and regular communications. From week to week the progress of the Talisman, impeded by bad weather and floating ice, was faithfully recorded, until at last the party with long-handled axes went down to Beardstown to welcome her. It is needless to state that Lincoln was one of the party. His standing as a scientific citizen of New Salem would have been enough to ensure his selection, even if he had not been known as a bold navigator. He piloted the talisman safely through the windings of the Sangamon, and Springfield gave itself up to extravagant gaiety on the event that proved she could no longer be considered an inland town. Captain Bogue announced fresh and seasonable goods just received per steamboat talisman, and the local poets illuminated the columns of the journal with odes on her advent. The joy was short-lived. The talisman met the natural fate of steamboats a few months later, being burned at the St. Louis Wharf. Neither state nor nation has ever removed the snags from the Sangamon, and no subsequent navigator of its waters has been found to eclipse the fame of the earliest one. End of section 4 Recording by Pamela Krantz